Father God, it's so good to meet with your people. And from Psalm 65, praise awaits you, our God in Zion. To you, our vows will be fulfilled. You who answer prayer, to you all people will come. When we were overwhelmed by sins, you forgave our transgressions. Blessed are those you choose and bring near to live in your courts. We are filled with the good things of your house, of your holy temple. Father God, we pray that you would help us to grow. We pray that we would get to know our brothers and sisters better, especially through Everyone Host One, one of our goals for this year, so that we could be a close and a caring family. Father, we pray particularly for some of our staff, for Jess Forrester, Joel Hingston, Scott Lavender, as they help music and creative uh, communication to reach out. Father, we pray for all our staff, for strength, inspiration, wisdom, discretion, and your Holy Spirit to enable and empower them in their work for the gospel so that you will be glorified and your kingdom will grow. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Father, we pray for some of our special events coming up in September. We pray for Jesus Club with a movie night on 9th of September. We pray for National Grandparents Conference on the 16th of September and the Fair Trade Market on the 30th. Father, please help these events to glorify you and to help people understand that you want our whole lives, not just our Sunday mornings. Father God, we thank you for our godly team of nominators. Please encourage them in the challenges of this task. Guide them through your Holy Spirit so that they may be led to the right candidate for the role of senior minister. We pray that you would prepare our church family to move into a new phase of growth so that we would accept the changes that you bring and move with confidence in your goodness. Dear Father, we also pray that you would strengthen and encourage all the staff members at St Paul's who are working extra hard to lead us, teach us and facilitate our programs. Thank you for each one of this wonderful team. Help them to know that they are much loved and that every aspect of their work is valuable in your sight. And we pray this also in the name of Jesus. Amen. Father God, we each have people who are on our heart, who are suffering in various ways, in body, in mind, in soul. Father, we name them now before you, before your throne. Please comfort, strengthen them, grant them the peace that only you can give. We hand them to you, Father, knowing that you love them. We put them into your safe hands. And we pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Father, we pray for us, our hurting world. Help us to see this world through your eyes. Help us to honour each person as they are made in your image. Help us to love the lost and the lonely, to empower the helpless, and to be your ministers on earth. Finally, Father, we pray for Keith Baker as he teaches us from your word today. Thank you for his servant heart and his gentle wisdom. Inspire him as he teaches us and inspire us to follow your word and to obey you. Help us to hear with our hearts and minds so that we may follow you and obey your message to us today. Father, we pray all of these things in the precious name of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Good morning, church.
We're going to continue reading in the book of Hosea. So can you please turn to chapter 11, starting at verse 1. Hosea chapter 11, verse 1 to 11. When Israel was a child, I loved him, and out of Egypt I called my son. But the more they were called, the more they went away from me. They sacrificed to the Baals, and they burned incense to images. It was I who taught Ephraim to walk, taking them by the arms. But they did not realize it was I who healed them. I led them with cords of human kindness, with ties of love. To them, I was like the one who lifts a little child to the cheek, and I bent down to feed them. Will they not, re will they not return to Egypt? And will not Assyria rule over them because they refuse to repent? A sword will flash in their cities. It will devour their false prophets and put an end to their plans. My people are determined to turn from me. Even though they call me God Most High, I will by no means exalt them. How can I give you up, Ephraim? How can I hand you over, Israel? How can I treat you like Admar? How can I make you like Zeboyim? My heart is changed within me. All my compassion is aroused. I will not carry out my fierce anger, nor will I devastate Ephraim again. For I am God and not a man, the Holy One among you. I will not come against their cities. They will follow the Lord. He will roar like a lion. When he roars, his children will come trembling from the west. They will come from Egypt trembling like sparrows, from Assyria fluttering like doves. I will settle them in their home, declares the Lord. sure you know me as a suave, sophisticated, cricket-loving comedian from my time here on the platform. But how could you get to know the real me, the substance behind all the comedy gold? I was cleaning up around home the other day and I stumbled across this. This is my diary prayer journal from my younger years. And in it, I poured out my inner self, my thoughts and emotions towards my girlfriend, who became my fiance, became my wife. And reading through it, I poured out my heart to God about all the sorts of things that were, were going on inside of me in my uh, prayer life with him. If you were to get hold of something like this, you would know something of the real me, something of my inner heart. Imagine if you could get to know the inner heart of God himself. Imagine you had more than just history and lore on stone tablets and you actually got to see inside of his personal diaries. Well, today we get to do just that. And what we will discover as we do that makes all the difference in the world to knowing who God is and how we approach him each day. Uh, we've been working our way through the book of Hosea across this term, and let's be honest, it's been tough going. Uh, we've seen over and over again God's condemnation spoken over his people Israel because they've been unfaithful. They've turned to other gods, they've turned to other nations, they've turned to immorality and evil. And any return towards God that from them has been half-baked, half-hearted, 
It's been all outward form, ticking boxes, no inner heart. But the journey through chapters 1 to 10 is worth it if we can arrive here at chapter 11. Because chapter 11 of Hosea is a mountaintop of the book, of the whole Old Testament really. There's nothing like this chapter in the rest of the Old Testament. For here through his prophet, God lays his heart bare for us to see. Here we get to see the inner motivations and passions of the God who created the world. And as we dive into God's diaries, his personal expression of his heart, what we see is God's love. God's love expressed in three ways that I want to unpack for us this morning as we work through the chapter. Firstly, we see in this chapter that God loves like a tender father. God loves like a tender father. Now, next weekend is Father's Day. Uh, I'm not sure what my kids are going to do because I already have the socks, the barbecue apron and the coffee mug that declare that I am the world's greatest dad. So uh, good luck, boys. There you go. But one of the things we like doing is looking back over photos of when the kids were little, uh, remembering my experience of a father over their lifetimes. It's such a joy to do. And as this chapter begins in Hosea 11, it's a bit like God looking through his photo album with little Israel. Hosea 11 verse 1, When Israel was a child, I loved him. And out of Egypt, I called my son. Israel, the nation, the the people, they were God's son. Hosea is pointing back in history to the Exodus. In Exodus 4.22, God is speaking to Moses and he says to Moses, Then say to Pharaoh, this is what the Lord says, Israel is my firstborn son. And I told you, let my son go so that he may worship me. Israel were the son that God had adopted. They weren't powerful or impressive like the rest of the nations. They had nothing in and of themselves to merit God's attention. Rather, they were simply the son that God had freely chosen to adopt out of his love that they might know him and his love, which is what makes their actions to leave him all the more painful. Hosea 11.2, But the more they were called, the more they went away from me. They sacrificed to the Baals, and they burned incense to the images. But nonetheless, God keeps looking back with affection and continues to open up the photo album described him in like a little toddler. Verse 3, it was I who taught Ephraim to walk, taking them by the arms. But they didn't realize it was I who healed them. I led them with cords of human kindness, with ties of love. To them, I was like one who lifts a little child to the cheek and I bent down to feed them. God rescued them from slavery in Egypt. He fed them manna and quail as they walked through the desert. He was tender with them, lifting them up to his cheek to kiss them. It's a beautiful picture of care and affection. This is the heart of God. This is the heart of our God. And we're not left to guess whether God has that kind of tender love for you and for me living all these years after the prophet Hosea was speaking. What's fascinating as the Bible unfolds is that we discover that Jesus was the perfect son that Israel could never quite be. You see this in one of the famous Christmas readings from Matthew chapter 2 talking about the visit of the wise men to see Jesus. Matthew 2 and verse 13, When they, that's the wise men, the Magi, when they had gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up, he said. Take the child, that's the baby Jesus, 
and his mother and escape to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. So he got up, took the child and his mother during the night, and left for Egypt, where he stayed until the death of Herod. And so was fulfilled what the Lord had said through the prophet, Hosea, out of Egypt I called my son. Matthew quotes Hosea 11, verse 1. But instead of here of the son referring to Israel, here the son refers to Jesus. In other words, Jesus fulfills what Israel was meant to be. Jesus is the son who always experiences the father's tender love. And Jesus comes into the world that we might share in that love as well. Now, listen to these astonishing words from Jesus' prayer to his Father in John 17. Jesus says, Righteous Father, though the world does not know you, I know you, and they know that you have sent me. I have made you known to them and will continue to make you known in order that the love that you have for me may be in them. And I myself may be in them. Did you hear that? Don't miss what's being said here. The love that you have for me, says Jesus, may be in them. God the Father has loved the Son perfectly for all eternity. The picture in Hosea 11 is a window into this. And that love that the Father has for the Son eternally, that love is given to us. It's everything that we would ever want. It is to be known intimately. It is to be valued. It is to be celebrated. It is to be delighted in. The love for the Son of God is now given to all who are children in God by trusting in the Son. That's why John can write 1 John 3 verse 1, See what great love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. So whatever you are facing at the moment, brothers and sisters, Whatever you are facing, whether it's pressure at work, whether it's pressure with finances, whether it's pressure in relationships with family, with friends, or with other people here at church, whatever it is, know this. The Father loves you as he loves his own son. He stoops to pick you up And hold you to his cheek and kiss you because he delights in you so much. Hold on to this picture dearly for it's real now. And one day that reality will be right in front of your eyes. God loves like a tender father. The second thing we see is that God loves at a cost. God loves at a cost. If the first part of Hosea 11 is like looking at God's photo album, it's this next part of the chapter that's like looking into God's diary, hearing his inner thoughts. First you hear the frustrated parent who knows that their unruly child shouldn't get away with it. Uh, Hosea 11 verse 5. Will Israel not return to Egypt? And will not Assyria rule over them because they refuse to repent? He's talking about a return to slavery. Like they're going back into Egypt. God brought them out of Egypt in the Exodus. He's saying it'll be like they're going back under Egypt. Except this time it won't be Egypt. It'll be Assyria. They'll go into slavery under Assyria. Will not Assyria rule over them because they refuse to repent? A sword will flash in their cities. It will devour their false prophets. It will put an end to their plans. My people are determined to turn from me. Even though they call me God most high, 
I will by no means exalt them. This is God speaking of justice. They've done wrong, his people. They've broken the covenant. They've been unfaithful. They've practiced evil. And so, knowing that, God is saying nothing should prevent the consequences for that falling upon them. But even as he says this, the father's heart is stirred by the agony of his love. Listen to the tension. Hosea 11 verse 8. Then how can I give you up, Ephraim? How can I hand you over, Israel? How can I treat you like Adma? How can I make you like Zeboim? My heart is changed within me. All my compassion is aroused. I will not carry out my fierce anger, nor will I devastate Ephraim again. For I am God and not a man, the Holy One among you. I will not come against their cities. Can you hear God's heart? He's saying, how can I give you up? How can I destroy you like Adma and Zeboim, those cities that were destroyed in the past along with Sodom and Gomorrah? No, no, no. I love you. My heart is full of compassion. For I am the Holy One, not a man, says God. We're used to hearing God's holiness, His otherness invoked when it comes to punishment of sin, aren't we? God is holy and therefore sin can't stand before Him and it must bring His wrath. But here, God says it's His holiness that binds Him faithfully to his son Israel. As it's presented here in these diaries, it is the, the turmoil of love versus justice. Any parent who's had a child goes, go off the rails knows all about this turmoil. How can they do that again? How will they ever learn if they don't face the consequences? And yet, how can I give them up? How can I want that for them? When they are the child that I picked up and kissed their cheek. Here in Hosea, those two things, the love and the justice, are presented side by side with, with no real apology and no way forward to reconcile how they could both be true. And it's a dilemma for any of us in our relationship with God. How can God our Father express his love for us when we fail him time and time again? How can he be just with the ways that we've turned our back on him and yet at the same time forgive our sins? The answer lies in the costly cross of Christ. The Apostle Paul puts it like this in Romans 3.25. God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his blood to be received by faith. He did this to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance he had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. He did it to demonstrate his righteousness at the present time so as to be just and the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus. To be just against sin and to express his love and compassion and forgiveness for us. God himself pays the consequences of our sin. Jesus' perfect life, the son who always loved God, was always loved by the father. His life is credited to us. And our sin is credited to Jesus on the cross as he dies on the cross. But God raises him from the dead to show that he was not dying for his own sins but ours. That God vindicates him from the grave. That God counted his death as a sacrifice for us. And that the price has been paid. It is finished. And so the agony that we see God going through in Hosea 11 is brought to a resolution at the cross. 
the sins of God's people face justice by the sin bearer, the Son of God, in a way to let the children of God live in gratitude and joy and freedom. So let me ask you, brothers and sisters, is that how you are living? Is that the way you're walking? Do you realize that God's love means that Jesus, his son, paid for everything that you've done and all that you will do? Many people I speak to say, yes, yes, you talk about the cross and forgiveness and all that kind of stuff, but you don't know what's happened in my life. You don't know what I've done. God may be able to forgive me, but I just can't forgive myself. If that is you, let me gently say to you, if the God of heaven and earth went to the extent of giving his son so that you could be forgiven and know that you are loved, then who are you to withhold forgiveness from yourself? There's a danger in that approach that you are putting yourself above God. As though your forgiveness of yourself is more important and harder to win than God's forgiveness of you. Brothers and sisters, hear the word of the Lord. God has loved you at a cost. And he will not give you up. And so walk in that freedom. Walk in that freedom. Which brings me to the third way we see God's love in this passage. God loves by calling home. God loves by calling home. Back in chapter 7, we saw God portrayed as a lion coming in judgment on his people. He was going to come and savage them because of their sin. It's a terrifying image. But here in chapter 11, God is a lion whose voice summons his people home. Look with me at verse 10. They, that is Israel in the future, they will follow the Lord. He will roar like a lion. And when he roars, his children will come trembling from the west. They will come from Egypt trembling like sparrows. From Assyria fluttering like doves. I will settle them in their homes, declares the Lord. Hosea envisages a time when God's people, who are currently, when he's speaking, living in the land, they won't be in the land anymore. They will be ensnared by the enemy. They will be living under the slavery of Assyria. And they will have chosen that future through their own sinfulness. But when God's voice is heard, Hosea envisages a time when they will come out back to the home that God has lovingly prepared for them. Now this came to pass in a partial way. In Old Testament history, when the southern kingdom of Judah returned from exile in Babylon, 587, we are told there that a remnant of people from the northern kingdom of Israel came back to the land with them. 1 Chronicles 9, if you want to look it up later. But that's a partial fulfillment of what Hosea was speaking about. The real lion's roar comes with the declaration of the gospel of the Lord Jesus, who was the Lion of Judah. When that message is preached that Jesus is king because he has slayed the enemy on the cross and has risen and is now on the throne, when that message is preached, captives are set free from the bondage of sin, from the, the kingdom of the evil one. You see this over and over in the narratives of the gospel. When Jesus the king comes to announce the kingdom, people pass from slavery into freedom, from bondage into liberty, from death into life. As it is for any of us who hear the voice of God in the message of the gospel and respond with our lives. For us, the promise is that Jesus is preparing a place for us right now. And you have guaranteed entry. I don't know if you've tried to get tickets to Taylor Swift. 
you try to get entry into that festival of whatever it's going to be. Not many people got tickets to that. You want to know if you can go in the future with the, with the king? The trust in the Lord Jesus is guaranteed way in. It's like it's in your digital wallet and nothing can take it away. And what peace there is now knowing that this is our future. What peace. This last few weeks I've been to three funerals. And they knew that Jesus was preparing a place for them. And so those funerals were filled with hope. All these three wonderful pictures come together on the lips of Jesus. I reckon he must have had Hosea 11 in mind when he tells the story of the lost son in Luke 15. Listen to all the themes that we've just heard in Hosea as Jesus finishes the story. Luke 15 verse 20. But while he, that's the son who left and squandered all his living and left the father, went under bondage, while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Uh, put a ring on his finger and, and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and, and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and he's alive again. He was lost and he's found. And so they began to celebrate. Brothers and sisters, that father is ours. That grace is ours. That welcome home is ours. Praise be to the gracious God for his love for us in Jesus. Let me pray. Gracious Father, uh, we thank you for allowing us to see into your inner heart in this chapter, to see the turmoil in the Father's heart, to see the love and the tender compassion towards your children. Father, we praise you for Jesus, the perfect Son. We praise you that we are included in him, that your love for him is ours, because we are children of God. Father, today... Will you help us to live in that freedom? To see you as a compassionate, tender father, delighting in us as we walk each day. May that be a motivation for our prayers. May that be a motivation for our love towards those you place in our path. May you sink the truth, the joy, the freedom of the gospel deep into our hearts and minds by your spirit this day, that we might glorify you for all that you've done. And we pray it in Jesus' name and all God's people said, Amen.